Hello, greetings everyone, and welcome to this talk. I will start presenting slides in a moment. Um, this is not an advanced topic, but I it, it more touches the the human nature than the technology, and the, also how technology connects all this together. How how to uh, make it work for your project. And probably most of these pieces you knew before, and uh, most of them, these practices are familiar to you, but I am trying to explain why they exist and why you want them in your project. So let me switch to slides now. Now let me find my presenter notes. Here are the slides, you see them, I guess. Okay, great. Yeah, let's let's go. This waiting room still. Okay, so um, the name of the talk is Monkey Take the Wheel, and I will explain who is the monkey and uh, why you are interested to to let the monkey do the job and not the smart person you are. So a word about me. Uh, my name is Mitro Litovchenko, or Eric called me Dima, that's the diminutive, or what is it, the, the variant of the name. I am employed in Erlang Solutions Sweden for like eight years now, and um, I have 25 years experience of looking busy my computer, and uh, with some by products, like uh, programs coming out of my hands. So you can find me on Twitter and uh, I think Facebook is the same handle and uh, some other chats you can find me the same handle as well. So this unique name on the internet you can find it on GitHub as well. Um, yeah, you might have seen my Beam Wisdoms website. It's gathering low, low level technical info explained in an easy language and uh, you might have heard about my virtual machine experiment in Rust. That project is uh, on pause, but it teaches something that is not hard to start a virtual machine. Writing your own virtual machine that will run a beam. Okay, so uh, as a developer working on some project, I would totally be interested to have my work going far easier and then it looks, I would be interested to have less friction. I, to, I, I don't want my code to resist me. I don't want my tools to resist me. I want to understand the, the code I'm looking at and I want to do less thinking because thinking is hard and I still want to maintain the high quality. So that's the usual like lazy wins and uh, we still are required to deliver the quality. And I would like, to uh, when doing larger refactorings and code changes, I would like my tools to help me, to point me in the right direction to finish my refactoring and not get stuck somewhere in the middle and like, with a broken code that I have to drop. And so I want some easier gliding through my work. So there are plenty of tools and language, uh, both languages and Erlang and Elixir, they have constructs in the language to allow you more relaxed development. And uh, by understanding why you need some of these techniques and why you need some of these tricks, uh, you, would, you would know when you want to use them. So it will be easier to develop, to read your code and easier to debug. So that's, that's the motivation of this talk. You will see why it is easier. So you might find that each particular device is trivial. Everyone seems to want to do this, but uh, like everyone is speaking like, like your code cleaner and make your algorithm simpler, but not always, they explain why. And the goal of this talk is rather give understanding why this exists. So part one, how human brain works. This is an introduction to the brilliant explanation of how human brain operates and how things like procrastination work. I will mention what is procrastination for those who don't know yet. And it's, it's a big problem in everyone's life and uh, we need to also work around it. 
so there's this book uh, written by, by this person, Daniel Kahneman. He's a Nobel Memorial Prize laureate of 2002 in economics, and he made, uh, he wrote this book. And this book is explaining, it's like, if you re read even half of it, you will get the gist. Explains how the human brain operates and uh, why we are, uh, why we exist like two separate personalities. Uh, so he said, um, he said he observed, he, he tested with his friends and uh, he observed and uh, the book explains that we operate in two uh, modes. There's system one and system two. And system one is when we are the smart person and system two is when we don't think we just go ahead and just have fun and click something. So there's a system one. It is fast, it's automatic, it's... Uh, quick to judge, it's quick to bring up emotions, it's stereotypic because quick to judge because you have prejudice, uh, you already have your reaction to some topics. And it is unconscious, so it, it just happens. Whatever system one does, it just happens. It's like, it's our native language, it's our understanding of the native language. It, on Using this native language ability, this is how our advertisements work, this is how language tricks work. It just triggers in our brain and, and we, we have the fact in our head. So also our muscle memory, things like walking, cycling, or driving a car or on a empty street, things like this. Um, also memorized or learned uh, actions, reactions, answers, and quick judgments. Like how far is, is this, uh, like, like how far to throw a ball in, in a, football field or basketball field, this kind of thing you operate with system one. And basically that's, uh, that is us in this, in this mode. So we don't think we are happy, we are getting emotions and uh, it's also cheap to stay in the system. It's uh, uh, effortless. We don't get tired operating in system, in system one. majority of our days we spend like this and as a developer that's relaxed relaxed coding that's easy algorithms that typing things you typed a million times before and that's following checklists that you prepared as a to-do list or something it's uh, also not very smart so you can understand simple constructs simple ideas but going deep into business logic or why some decision is made in this code it is quite hard for this system one for the monkey and then uh, system two is is us is the best of us it's the slow effortful um, logical thinking personality that is able to do calculations that it is mindful and in this system we, we can do mathematics we can judge we can estimate something we can compare something that's not trivial we can also do planning this mode like planning for the day or planning for a week and we can do precision work that requires focus like tight parking on the street so system two overrides system one when it activates so we, we by the power of will when we need to focus we bring up system two and uh, when it is tired it shut down so your capacity is exceeded you cannot do it anymore you like things like uh, you cannot think while walking so the two systems conflict, or you cannot be driving in a turn in your car and at the same time multiply some numbers in your head. So these two systems conflicting. But sometimes uh, uh, you can depict this like this, uh, so that's very hard. Uh, but you can notice that three gears are connected in, the, in a deadlock. So, well, that's when we are depleted, we cannot think anymore. Uh, so, uh, as a developer in System 2, you are very smart, you are knowledgeable, you remember all your lessons learned before, you can do planning, you can design your, your system, your code, your, everything you do, you can learn new things, you can understand, you can do code reviews. Uh, that's why code reviews are hard, because you get tired really quick, because you have to focus and you, you don't just click like, I don't like this, this tab in, or this space in the review, you need to think and it's hard. 
and also investigations, like uh, looking for bugs, for problems, and so on. So being at your computer, you'd be the smartest uh, system too. You would be the smartest person in the room. You can reason, you can estimate, plan ahead, design, discuss. Will it scale? Will it web scale? What can go wrong? And uh, walls of code begin making sense. You also can understand the old legacy code because you see why they done it this way. Even if it's terrible and hard to read, you you in this mode you can do you you, you can handle this. So that's basically the system too at work. But again, it is hard. It quickly depletes, so you cannot stay like this all day. And there is this guy Tim Urban. He he had the TED talk. You can find it on YouTube, and he also had an article on on his website waitbutwhy.com. And um, what the article says in, in, in a few words that uh, he names the system one a monkey and the other one, he, uh, he doesn't name the other one, it's just us, but not a monkey. So the monkey is the rational decision maker. Mon monkey seeks the reward, the instant emotional gratification, and monkey wants to have fun and avoid all the work. And then he introduces the deadline monster that those are plush figures you can buy on his website as well. So the deadline monster comes when we are short on time and he bites us and scares the monkey and uh, we start thinking and, and working properly and the project is delivered. So some people start mistakenly believe that deadlines help them to be more productive, but instead they gain tolerance and begin ignoring more and more deadlines or sometimes people like, let's make deadline every day. Uh, this will not work, you just learn to ignore them and monkey wins again. And the word on procrastination, that's the very familiar feeling to all of you when, when you start avoiding some tasks that you don't want to do. Or you could pick some tasks that, that is like less important and do it instead. That's one trick to get things done. Or sometimes you just do something else. You just watch some kittens on the YouTube. So. Uh, when you get stuck between multiple tasks, some of them don't offer instant win or instant gratification. You don't get fun or you don't get feeling of completion. So you try to pick something smaller that instant, uh, gives you instant reward. And the way to fight it is to split your work into smaller tasks, easy to complete, and pre-plan them in some sort of checklist. But as a joke, uh, if you split the large task into tiny, easy to ignore tasks, then you can ignore everything. Uh, so back to the thinking mode. Uh, thinking mode is not sustainable, it is hard. And uh, operating is in this system two mode consumes the brain fuel, or some books call it ego, and you can also call it mental energy. When it is depleted, system two shuts down, you feel like you've done for today. And the only way to temporarily extend this is by having some pressing situation like looming deadline that will last you a little bit longer. And you cannot sit focused and be thinking all day. You have to ration your mental energy and use it wisely. Um, so you can organize your work. You should organize your work, like starting your day with with a round of planning, like write a checklist for a day. You don't need any fancy application. You don't need any whiteboard or something, just a, an empty notepad with three lines of plan that will do. Um, designing your work in ahead, in advance, investigating your problems, reviewing the code. Uh, that's when you need your mental energy. These tasks should be priority when you're rested and when you can do it, when you have the energy to do it. But the system one is the monkey uh, should operate the rest of your day when when you need to conserve the energy and be functional for entire time the things like following the plants the checklist are super easy for the monkey simple code that's easy to read easy to write or experimenting like modifying what will happen if i want to change this a to b and run it again this kind of thing is perfect for the monkey so imagine the situation you're losing control. The play monkey plays drive, but monkey cannot drive. And then both are really in a big, big trouble. Um, so yeah, let's go to the next part, the part about your code. Um, you might already know things like organizing your projects or 
uh, defining clean, clean code style or other best practices, but why these practices are called best. And they are recognized as useful by many people and they make it easier to work with the code and easier to read and to understand it to avoid many classes of mistakes. It, it, this allows the monkey to operate longer and you not having to switch to the thinker, to the system too. So how all projects start and all projects are start equally good. So you have a set of tasks. Imagine this is your legacy project that is now terrible. This is your legacy project 10 years ago. It was, it was small. The requirements were short. You made it perfect or you or your ancestors, the developers working before you, they made it perfect. It was perfect on that day. It was perfect on that year, but then, then time comes and requirements change. And uh, some pieces of your code, of your project, keep, like stop making any sense. They, they are not true anymore, but they still a part of the code flow. And that's your former, yesterday's perfect code is becoming legacy now that's now terrible and hard to manage. So of course, uh, some, some quick, dirty, uh, prototypes that were never perfect but if they survived for 10 years to become legacy does it mean that it was good at the time so you need to you need some uh, let's say ways of working to make uh, your code manageable in the future readable understandable and so on so that's the black box that your legacy has become and it's literally it's hard and terrible to see inside it so one thing to follow is the least surprise principle. And the more predictable and boring your code looks, the better it will be for the future generations to read it. And remember, your code is written once to be read many, many times in the future. And it's better for yourself too. You will forget your own code even in like several weeks. You, your short term memory will clear and you will have no idea who wrote this terrible code. Oh, it was me. Uh, so my experience is just you look away for two weeks and you forget everything. So when you lost something and then, then for example, you store, uh, like you store your code at the expected location. For example, when you lost something, like at your home, you lost the key, key to some lockbox. And uh, you found it again, but the first place where you went looking for it, it becomes the new preferred location. It's where you want to see the key. It's where you want to see the thing you lost. So uh, you lost some code, you found it, but you think it belongs somewhere else, then it should be moved. It means next time you will look there again and you will find it. Uh, of course, well, probably it's a good idea to synchronize with other developers. Will they be looking in the same place too? Yeah, like bring it up in the meeting. I want to move this to this directory. So it's tested. This technology works, uh, this approach works, it's, it's friendly to monkeys. Monkey will be happy to find the code, uh, the function or the class where you put it. Well, there are no classes in Erlang or Elixir, but there are structures and modules. And sometimes we are getting lost in larger projects. And then a few things about new developers. So imagine you are running a project and it's not a single person project. You will have people joining your project. So you can have some safe assumptions about them that they can use the tools, they have some editor, they can navigate the code and you don't expect them to just use in, to be using line editor or something really, really slow and uh, without any user interface. But you never know, some projects require people to use slow terminals and really minimalistic editors. So you would expect the developer to have some tools and they will be able to run your make file or mix or rebar commands and they will be very happy to run your checks and tests. So you need to place the, the, the key things in your project very close to start somewhere in the make file in the readme, like run this to build, run this to test, run this to uh, the deliver, deploy or something or make a release. So that's your safe bets on the future developer. And also new developer has a lot to learn. So, so remember that they will have to read your code and sometimes it's not so simple that projects, some projects become very big. 
So you can assume that they have no idea what dependencies your project need. They will have no idea how to build tests around it. They may have no idea if your project requires a few empty directories to start. How do they know you can create them in Makefile, for example? So you don't need to store the sacred knowledge. Uh, or maybe there's some special build order, maybe some special environment variable to set to build. So prepare a few make file targets or some mixed tasks, uh, custom rebar plugin maybe that will do the things for your new developer. And your old developers will also be happy with this. And also report the errors. Uh, how do I know the directory is missing? Uh, I'm, I'm new here, please help me. And they consider a better build system. Uh, some projects are that exist for many, many years, they're using the really complex build systems like uh, trees of make files that are impossible to read, they build from templates and and you can look as the, 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 the closest example would be the OTP source. It's a legacy project, it exists for 20 or something years as uh, in this form and its build uh, system is not simple at all. Um, but it's uh, really important to have an easy place to, to enter, to, to build your project and to run it. And uh, if it's not so easy, it might be worth to slowly migrate it to something simpler. It helps everyone. It not just helps the new developer, it helps everyone. So even if some teams still know how this works, they will slowly leak, lose people and uh, the knowledge will be lost. And uh, you can rework the build system, but slowly. Never try to break everything at once. Start from smaller projects and go up till you make everything good. Like changing old make files to rebar. Start from smaller sub projects and go up. Uh, structure your modules. Longer modules are bad. And uh, like the ro rule of thumb would be 1000 lines. That's something you can hear often or even shorter. So it's always confusing to find code in wrong location. Uh, for example, client code should not be located in the server module. Uh, so find some appropriate names. If something does not match the module it is in, maybe it's a time to make a new module. Group your network code together and move it out of the logic and use things your language has for splitting the modules in groups. Elixir has namespaces for that. Erlang has to use prefixes in directories. Uh, it's still flat namespace inside them, but prefixes help a little. Uh, so yeah, don't don't make surprises. Don't hide your code in bigger modules. Uh, this is good for reading and finding things later. And then naming. Uh, it should flow like natural language. Uh, start your functions with a verb, for, for example, do something or connect something or read something or send something. So uh, the verb gives the idea that it will be doing something. Or if you're making a predicate that checks something, then you can use the question words like is, can, does, or whether, or things like this. And um, structures that represent some object or some business object or that represent some real thing uh, in the live world, like an item in your shelf, in your storage, that should be forming a noun. And then together it will read, like do something with a noun. That's quite easy to read. And your monkey that's using natural language will be thankful for this because you look at the line of code and you see the action on something, on an object that is a noun. Um, also just back to this. So, so this could be as well, uh, this could be a, a heuristic for a code style check like Elvis. Uh, it could be like a limited set of like a vocabulary of verbs or something that would check that uh, the functions adhere to natural language and having word or question more that it from. And uh, you should structure your code visually. Um, the code will be read multiple times. The, your eye should glide effortless and see all the bumps in your code. Uh, what goes in and what goes out, that should be clear. Parameters go in or globals and results go out. And try to reduce the amount of uh, knowledge or wisdom per line. You should avoid multi-level formulas. You should avoid long conditions. You 
give them names. You still need them. You still need this in your logic, but give them names and spread them over several lines. And when it when it is compiled, the output will be the same, but it will be so much easier to read. To reduce the vis visual complexity, don't make things that stretch over out out of your screen. Uh, you can also modify your formatting settings to uh, line up the assignments, to line up structure fields, to align your data to vertically and horizontally. It really helps to spot errors and it it helps uh, to read it. Uh, sometimes you have to do manual steps to make this work. It's probably not worth it. But if you can do this with a few clicks in your options, go ahead, this helps. And um, making short functions that explain what, what they do and why they exist. And uh, most importantly, why they exist. That's the knowledge that will be lost over years. Uh, your future uh, you or new developer in a year or two will ask why why this function was, was written do you remember and the comment will be there saying oh there was a customer that had this specific computer type and it did not work so we made this function so this this is kind of knowledge that goes into into why comment and it's the most valuable documentation why the code was made this way and also the documentation which is too far from code, like um, some corporations uh, prefer building the documentation separately and hosting it somewhere in the internal network, which is probably good for your customers. They will not have to build documentation, they just can access internal portal. But for developers, it's quickly becoming obsolete. If you get some older branch or you get some like 10 year old branch, the, the documentation will not exist. Uh, because it is somewhere else. It is very good to store things together. The most important key knowledge should be stored together or perfectly in, in the code itself. Because in several years you will have this, like cannot find the server, it's gone. Uh, there is no docs and uh, there is some obscure XML format which no one can build. So be careful with your docs, don't lose them and try to hold them together. Drop README as well. README are good. README helps to understand the code. Um, <clears throat> also, sometimes uh, it's good to make a note if function is used or not used somewhere. Of course, your editor will be able to find it. You can go, like, click go to definitions, like control click uh, function or something. But you don't always do this. You just uh, your your eyesight just goes along the code. You you see, you see this is only used in one location. And uh, uh, you don't need to control click it, you will see it. But uh, as a, if the reference destination is moved elsewhere, of course, this will probably become obsolete, this comment. But other, all the other time, it will be useful. It will still uh, make sense. It, 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 it saves you a control click and waiting for the results. Uh, there is a concept called cyclomatic complexity, which measures how many branches your function has. So how many ifs and case switches uh, you have and if they're nested and that increases the complexity. Why this metric exists? This is the complexity of testing the code because you need to cover every line. And uh, cyclomatically complex code is really hard to test. You need to satisfy every condition in every combination to test every branch. So you want to keep this metric low. It can be measured by automatic tools because it's basically calculating the uh, branches in your uh, parsed uh, code tree. So visually your code should be as straightforward as possible with as few conditions and branches as possible. That's really easy to read. You just top to down, no problem reading it. And um, there is also uh, the recommendation would be reduce code nesting where you can break the inner loops, inner conditions into separate functions, give them names, that helps a lot. And that does not make your code much slower. Um, there is also cognitive complexity. And this one, this is also a metric, but it is harder to measure. I think some really complex uh, commercial tools can measure somewhat this complexity. But this is basically 
this is a metric of how hard this is to understand. It's like you have walls of text with programming tricks with the multi-line conditions and uh, expressions. You have some hidden knowledge here. You call some strange functions that are not explained. You perform some locking of some some things that need to be locked, but nobody tells you as a programmer why this needs to be locked or unlocked. So this is like, like setting some bits in some variables without explaining why, or sending some magical message somewhere and not explaining why it's sent and what it will create. So this kind of code is cognitively complex. It is hard to read and it is hard to understand. You do not want this code in your program. You want to break it, into smaller functions, you want to explain why this exists, you want to refer to put comments referring to, to documentation pages if those exist, or referring to people names if it's too complex to, to express in text and things like this. So you, you should fight this and reduce the complexity of your code. And how you measure it, basically that's breaks in the linear flow of code. Again, this is the branches. But it's also nested branches and nested loops where the activity between them. It's not just like three nested ifs, but ifs where there's some code and some more ifs and some more code and some more ifs. So this kind of code is really hard to follow. Because you're, in your head you can remember like we read this branch, we read this branch next, and then we forget, we, don't, we never return and never read to the end because we've been distracted by the code elsewhere. So this code is uh, something that's hard to read in one go. You, you should try and avoid having such functions. And uh, many legacy projects have this. This is the really big, big waving red flag. This should be uh, fought and reduced and uh, simplified. Or at least commented why. Uh, the predictable code behavior, that's what you should strive to have in your code. What you think first it should do, then it does not require a comment. Then you just do your thing. Uh, but some surprises, if you do some illogical thing, they can cost days or weeks of debugging. But if you absolutely must do a logical thing, like if you absolutely, the, the example would be the, the GitHub uh, button. It was called, uh, originally it was called close and comment, I think. Close and comment, it was called. It was confusing people who thought, no, it was comment and close. People were thinking it's comment and clicking because people don't read the entire thing. People read the first word. And the first word was comment and close, comment. And then they swapped the, the, the words. It was comment and clo uh, close and comment, and people understood that this will close. And uh, there is a comment in, in, GitHub, in GitHub source that says this is intentionally made a non-English uh, uh, phrase, not non-English word order, because this is how people read it correctly and they understand what it means. And this is the most recent. They finally renamed end to with, so they now use close with comment. Now you kind of understand this, was, this, this will close, but also you leave the comment. So this is illogical and there is multi-line comment in GitHub source on this, why why this was made this way. So of course, everyone can be big brain when they have to, when they really focus and understand why the code is uh, really terrible this way or uh, why it's complex. But uh, you should seek to simplify it and make it easier to read instead of make it smarter. Because not uh, the monkeys who will read it, they're not smart. The monkeys will thank you later for, for simple things in your code. Also place your things predictably and name your things predictably that was mentioned before. And this is just a simple thing to keep your files in order. You, you place something where you expect it to be, like you expect macros to be on top of your file or you expect them in being a header file or related functions and types should be together. It's easy, of course, it's easy to control click or do something, press your key, key, key binding to navigate, but they, if they are together, it's easier. And if there are too many of them, then probably they are worth to have a separate module. And related function starts together and definitions on top, that's kind of thing. Be predictable, don't just randomly move your things around. And if you look, for example, at um, object-oriented languages like Java, C-sharp, they have 
more types of definitions in classes. You can have constants, privates, publics, you can have abstract, you can have static, and, and they all mix together and they create a mess that's impossible to read. And those languages have style checkers that enforce you sorting things in specific order. So when you, when you have the code sorted, then it's least uh, surprise, you know, the statics go first. Okay, I'm go I need static, let's go up. So expect that what the code is doing should be equal what is actually happening or what you think it's doing should be equal, yeah. So following the code startup path is the easiest way to unwind a new and complex project to learn how it starts. Imagine you are a new developer, you are given a big black box of spaghetti and you need to find where what happens next. You look for the starting module. Then you follow what is started from there. You follow which services are started. You follow what the initial sequences are. And then you basically, in your head, you have a model of started program. So just find where it begins. Uh, for that, you need uh, subdirectories and applications sorted nicely. And you need clean, visible boot up sequence where the start script is, what are the arguments, where they're going, and uh, where it starts. So from here you read. And uh, supervision tree should be easy to follow as well. Don't have like cross links and cross reference that are confusing. And uh, someone, and you, including you, will read this later and, and thank yourself, your past self, for doing it clear. And there's also a trick to learn the new. New code, you start from the boot. That's where, where it begins. A uh, few words on the tools that you have in your possession, in your language, and in your command line to make this experience bearable. So you can do code formatting. Uh, when you define automatic formatting, like your, your team lead and your team agrees that you format this way. You use like mix format or use LTID or use uh, Emacs format everywhere. And this basically eliminates all uh, arguments, how the code should look. This eliminates spaces versus tops. This eliminates eight or five indentation. And this eliminates like, should you have spaces between brackets or not and so on. So use those tools, they help. You can enforce them. That's really annoying to enforce the formatting tool in commit. You, f you change one space and everything goes sideways. So that's probably a less good thing to do, but use formatting, it helps you. And editor config, uh, dot editor config, there's a website on the internet explaining, and many editors support it. You define the style, you define spaces, tabs, you define formatting. For some editors like IntelliJ, you can define more, uh, uh, detailed, uh, give more detailed commands to formatting. Like this goes from new line, this goes with space after the previous symbol and so on, these kind of rules it also supports. Uh, you can have compile time checks uh, by using static typing. The Erlang and Elixir languages, they have static typing. They are strongly typed. And the fact that you can put anything into every variable, any variable, it does not mean the language is not strongly typed. You can use this to your uh, advantage. You can use structures with the strong key checking to also you can set types for them for to, to help the Eliza later to check it. You can prefer constants or over uh, constant values that will let the compiler check for you. So things like um, using the uh, atom in Erlang on the left or using the macro the macro will be checked in compile time. The atom will not be checked. You can have typo here. In Elixir, it is the same. You can use const that will be a macro uh, a value, or you can use the macro that will compile to this value, but also the compiler will check it for you. So you, you can use the compiler to check things you type often for possible typos. Uh, functions with many arguments, that's a pain point in some projects. You can have like 18, 20, 30 arguments sometimes and um, mix in order in one of them and you literally, so it's not working anymore or it can introduce some really subtle bug. So some functions absolutely have to have many arguments. So a good solution would be to use a keyed uh, or named so imagine like you have a function with many arguments. The, the good solution would be to use a map in Erlang or to use a struct. In Elixir, you would use a name that would be keyword arguments. 
and they will be checked in compile time for you. They will be you can even in Elixir or the map format, you can even confuse and mix the argument order, it will still be good. It will compile, but in the runtime it will stop and tell you like this key is missing. You are passing me something that I cannot re recognize. There is a runtime cost of building the argument tuple or argument map. Uh, but the benefit is massive. You get runtime and compile time check for this. So imagine you have rabbits that will be an elixir struct with a rabbit or will be an Erlang record with a rabbit or even a tuple with a rabbit. Then you try to feed a cow and the rabbit does not go here. That's basically, that's a strong type check right here and it's performed in runtime. It has very small price. It's literally one uh, assembly instruction and uh, like a nanosecond of, of, of time spent on this. But what you get, you never can feed rabbits here. Only cows go in this function. So this is kind of thing you, you can you can tag your uh, feeds. You can say this is a network server feed and you can say this is network client feed or you can tag uh, like this is a feed of something else that's neither a network, neither server nor, nor client. So that will let you drag the additional info with your value. And you can also match the data. This is closest static typing as you can get. But the cost is, is huge. So things like, like checking the degrees Fahrenheit Celsius, this is the book, uh, textbook example. And in Elixir you would do a similar thing and you would have this checked in runtime and the compiler will probably even with the elixir structures will do more checks for you in compile time as well so you you should be allowed if arguments are bad and you know it you should be allowed this or should crash this should create compiler error if you can the benefits are very big uh, Use your static checking tools. I'm not listing all possible tools because I maybe don't know them or they are new or uh, I'm just, uh, I basically don't use many tools for this, but more exist than this. You have dialyzer always, you have uh, how the Elixir tool is called, Dialixir, I think it's called. And you can use a static check, like style check by Elvis, and you can use code, code formatting, and you can use everything to, to, to make, uh, to make uh, loud noise about things that are wrong in your code. Uh, you don't need to think about it. You don't need to remember that you forgot something. The tools will find it. The machine is uh, made of metal. It does not care. It will think for you. And you can do your monkey thing and just relax and do your code. So there are plenty of tools. Uh, also more on time checks, you can do function guards. They allow more, more checking, more enforcing. Uh, so often people don't do the guards and guards exist. They help, they, they save your uh, debugging time. They don't allow bad inputs. And also safety check macros, you can do more debug macros and uh, uh, create more errors and create more things while building too bring up attention, use assertions as well. They create assertion exception usually. If it crashes all the way through your uh, supervision tree and creates a log message, that is helpful. You, it makes help your code clean. And in the release build, you can disable it as well. Uh, leave traces. So always it is, a, it is also Zen of Python number two. There's like 10 or something Zen of uh, wisdoms of Python. This is number two, explicit is better than implicit. Always make things visible. Stack traces sometimes not give you good info, not give you enough info. So leave more, like leave module name and function name in the stack trace. That will be question module and question function name macro in Erlang. And it should be similar in Elixir. Oh, there should be a more trickier way to insert this. Um, and they will point you where the error is coming from. Sometimes you have a bad arc coming from like 10 levels below and some proprietary code that you never seen and you don't know what it is. But if it contained module name and function name, that would help you quickly go to the problem. Uh, make your logs uh, readable. Uh, always log the location. So that's a standard option in all the loggers to log the, the module name and, and line. Standard loggers can do it uh, if you use some custom log. This is at least for debug is very important. 
And precise uh, synchronized time is really good when you run on multiple nodes. You just put your windows side by side and, and do some reading. That is helpful. Uh, mark your data. In typic, uh, typical, like stereotype, stere uh, uh, the right word is idiomatic, Erlang program would uh, have just records with uh, some values in them. But what instead you can do, you can use the record with, uh, in form of a map, you can use a record with uh, some sort of marks in it. What type it is it? What, when it was created, where it was created? Uh, sometimes your connections, for example, network connections can be created from 10 different locations in the code. And you don't know which is this you already really know. If you leave a, rec a field in this record where it was created, this will help you debugging later, leave traces. This will save you time in the future. And when you change a lot of things, you make it hard to leave things unfinished. So when you're doing large change, uh, large scale change, you make like put errors everywhere, put uh, printouts that are visible, create some con artificial errors that compiler will not let pass until you visit every location and leave comments that you can later find or you can teach your CI to scan for these to-dos and unfinished marks and uh, stop them from merging to master. Uh, you can, a few more slides, how you organize your workflow to make this, uh, to make your day more enjoyable. So you, you, you have system two that is the smart one, and system one that is the monkey you start your day from thinking you are rested you are full of energy you plan your day you make a checklist and then you switch to the checklist basically uh, the monkey is relaxed uh, developer state when you don't spend energy you just spend time reading and programming and implementing the checklist and in the end of the day you rest you just switch off everything and you go home oh i'm already home uh, so prefer simple. When you choose whether to implement an algorithm that is long or short, you prefer short or split it. Shorter is better, it's easier to read. Document why something was created, explain why it's not the way people expect it. Prefer the machine to check for you. Don't check everything yourself. You are smart today, you are focused, but tomorrow you will not be. Tomorrow the next person uh, you were hiring this person, they were smart, they were doing tests like brilliantly, but they will switch the monkey mode, they will do silly mistakes. Make it really hard for them to do silly mistakes. Make it easy to read, make it easy to follow. Your code should be simple. So also minimize, uh, that's like fighting your uh, procrastination and distractions, minimize the things you, that make you go off your task things that make you go search in the Google or documentations, things that make you switch windows, uh, terminal tabs to do something, minimize that, make everything in one command. I want to build, I do make build uh, or mix build, I uh, mix release or something, or I want to test, I do make test. I don't switch three windows and I, I don't start 17 servers. I don't want to do this, this is distracting. I will forget what I was doing by the end I, uh, when I finished installing everything or starting everything. So new developers will quickly learn it and they will enjoy it and they will start discovering new ways to run your project. So that was it. Uh, my recommendations on how to run your project by monkeys. Uh, thank you. Great stuff, Dima, thanks very much. I think we have, uh, one or two questions, but we're slightly behind schedule as well. Uh, let, let us see if we have one question from, from Raimo. Um, catch all and explicit error, bad arg versus just function clause, opinions. No, we can't hear you, Dima, you, you, you're muted. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. I, I'm explaining the principles. So you, you don't need to implement the way it's on slide. But uh, the principle is if you have some catch, catch all and it catches something and it remains quiet, it is bad. But if it creates a stuck trace and it's always a stuck trace at, ev at every con situation where you have this and you can find why it is here and what is the error, then it's good. So if it's loud and if it's possible to debug and find it, then it's good. 
if it's uh, catching all and just shutting down the error, then it's not good. You will not find it will just hide the error and five levels higher in the try catch. You will not get it.